Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Rules of Engagement. Today, as always, I'll be your host, Nick Axlav-Ranish, as we explore different strategies, strategies and tactics used in StarCraft II. This is a show that airs every weekday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and each day of the week, we have a unique theme. Let's take a look at a couple of those themes right now. Every Monday, we're going to have Talking Tactics. That's where we take a look at professional-level games from the highest calibers to play, analyze the tactics they use, and, and explain to you how you can use those tactics in your games at home to become a better player. Every Tuesday is Developing Fundamentals. That's where we take a look at the building block skill sets involved in StarCraft II and explain how to develop those skill sets on your end to jump up a level ladder and also how to appreciate when you see the true masters of StarCraft II how finely developed their fundamentals really are. Every Wednesday is going to be Mechanics of the Bazaar. That's where we take a look at professional level games, but ones where they do strategies that are a little bit offbeat, a little bit funky, and I, I talk about why that strategy worked or didn't work in that case, and why maybe we don't see it being used all the time in pro-level play. Thursday, that's today, is going to be the Community Critique. This is your chance to have your games looked at live on air. Go to MajorLeagueGaming.com slash replays, send me your replays, and I'll check them out every Thursday and analyze them in front of the camera for you guys. Friday is a day of self-reflection. That's where I take a look at my own games, kind of turn the analyzation glass on myself, see the things I did well, and of course the mistakes I make in my games, talk about the skills that, uh, th the things I do that actually don't require a whole ton of skill that you can win versus very top level opponents utilizing, and how you can take those back when you play, uh, you know, late night in your home or whatever, to curl up an extra level or two in the ladder. All these shows at 7, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. All these shows are on YouTube, at youtube.com slash official MLG SC2. And also don't forget at the end of every show, there's a question and answer period where you can tweet me any questions you want throughout the day. You can tweet it to me right now. You can tweet it to me uh, tomorrow, whenever you want. Every day at the end of the show, I check my Twitter, answer any questions I get live on air at the end of the show. So let's jump into today's episode. It's going to be community critique. There's a couple of replays I've been sent that I've selected to look over today. The first one is going to be a Protoss replay of MTL POW versus Storm talking about how to deal with late game PvZ. Then we're going to take a look at a Zerg replay, Iron Lund versus Null Pointer, talking about how to win utilizing mainly macro skills in ZVZ. Lastly, last replay is going to be a Terran replay, Majolner versus SDC, talking about how all the little small things you do add up in a game to make a big difference and can be the difference between winning or losing. Of course, at the end of the show, there's going to be the question and answer period. Submit your questions on Twitter to me, at ISAXLAB. I'll answer them at the end of the show. But now, let's jump into the late game PvZ of Majolner versus Storm. So, Majolner sent this replay in, and uh, he had a couple things to say. Is One, he had to say uh, he's worried about how to deal with late game PvZ. Uh, he's a Grandmaster Protoss. He's losing games that he thinks he had won, and he wants to know any little thing that he can do to improve on. And of course, he's thanking me for looking over the replay, which of course I'm going to do because it's nice to me. No, that's not the real reason. It's mostly because it's a great game, and he sincerely wants to learn some things from it. So as I look through this replay, there's going to be a couple things I'm going to point out. The first is going to be uh, how even if you want to have a strong late game, the best way to do that is to get into the late game in a better position by optimizing your opening no matter who you are, even the top level pros, often there's, there's just, uh, the better you get, it doesn't mean you're fully optimized. It means that the, the level of optimization is closer and closer and closer to being fully optimized, but you're never really gonna realize it unless there's some like insane robot AI who, who perfectly gnashed your equilibrium out, you know, 10 minutes of, of myriad decision making, uh, which, which there is no such thing. I mean, there's no AI, but <laughs> there's no AI that can do that yet. Anyways, then we're gonna talk about harassing Zerg. Uh, in, in the mid and late game, and then we're going to talk about handling late game engagements in Protoss vs. Zerg. So let's jump into this replay and talk a little bit about how the opening can be optimized. So if we look at the production tab, we can see it's a very standard opening. This is a grandmaster player. He's done an excellent job of macroing everything. Pro production has been perfect. Pylons, a spot on. Everything's gone really, really, really well. But now we look at the point, he's, he's building his Stargate. And there's couple ways to follow up the Stargate. The two main ones are some weird 8-gate semi, actually not semi, there's a weird, there, there's 8-gate all-in follow-ups you can do. If you're going to do that, uh, you just basically usually cut your probes right around now, 
maybe even some people go up to like 38 and then they cut their probe to these builds. Uh, let's say only two gases and you just get, you know, either a couple phoenixes or a couple void rays, whichever you want. Eight gates, go and kill them. But that's not what Majolner is doing because he wants to learn how to play late game. He's doing the more standard transition, which is going to be adding a robo, three gateways, and then a third base. And now, if you're going to go for that standard transition, if you're going to go Robotech after Stargate, you want to get your extra gases and your robotics facility as soon as possible. So as you play this replay, we're going to notice, okay, he's got the Stargate up. Now he has money. So right now, if you plan on teching, he should be getting the third and fourth gas right now. This is a little optimization, but instead, of course, he's going to wait a little bit, build up a little bit extra money, now getting the third gas. Now he's going to get the... Uh, still just not doing anything quite yet. Still not okay. There now he's getting three gateways first. So there's no robotics started yet. Not not the fourth uh, gas set. Instead, three gateways. So he's getting the gateways before the robotics, which would be great if you wanted to put on pressure. But uh, because I know that he's not looking to put on pressure this game, there's really no point in getting the gateways before the robotics. The robotics build time is more important. You'd rather get that immortal out early to bust down these rocks. So you can take a third. You'd rather get that observer out early so you can go spot these uh, spot the creep spread in case you get a void ready to kill that or spot their tech so you can tell if he's going to mute us, I should continue Phoenix production. Where are his queens? Where's a weak spot my Phoenix can attack? Is he getting a lot of roaches? Do I have to be afraid when I take that third base? Uh, so the robotics build time is more important than the gateway build time. So you want to get the robo first. So that's a small optimization is that he's getting these, these, these gateways here, the fourth gas is a little late, and then finally the robotics facility is going to be started right about now. But this is a couple minutes later than ideally would be started because you want to get a jump in attack if we're going to go to late game. So as we go through here, I mean, it's, that's, it's a relatively minor thing, but you know what? Uh, when you're Grandmaster play, all those minor things are, are, are important. I mean, he did literally everything picture perfect, except for maybe the build order could be slightly more optimized. So now let's, let's jump over to here. So uh, we're going to look at his vision. So he's scouted the fact Zerg player is going in faster. He's done a, a great job with his Phoenix Grass as well, actually. Um, but now he's at the point where, okay, the Zerg has, has boards everywhere. The, the Queens are defending. Can't harass more Phoenixes. I'm going to scout with them. So I know he's got a third base. I know he's on six gases. I know he's going Infestation Pit. Now, he's probably going to go for high play. Six gases, Infestation Pit. There could be some uh, Infestor timings, but those aren't too scary if you have a, a, a well-set-up defense with, you know, the wall here is pretty good, especially with a second pylon to reinforce it all. And then he can just keep his army to defend his third. So the main thing he's thinking about is the Zerg's probably going fast, uh, fast hive play, right? And in fact, as we fast forward this, he'll exactly confirm it. He thinks maybe he's pretty sure now, okay, a fourth base and an extra gas here. For sure, he's going fast hive. So the instant you know for sure the Zerg is going straight to hive, if you are not planning to do your own time attack, which he already went to Robo. It's pretty hard to do a time attack off two Robo because your, your gateway warpins. Uh, it's going to take a little longer to build up a big force because Robo units take longer to build. And in fact, he's getting a second forge here as well. So th th these investments mean that you don't really want to go for a time attack because you're making these late game investments. Robotics production, second forge. So if, you're, if, you're, if they're going Hive and you're not going for a time attack, you should start going for the mothership and the fourth base as soon as possible. And what does it mean possible? Well, uh, it means as soon as you're safe doing so. And you're basically safe doing so the instant you get some Colossi out. So uh, as soon as these two uh, Colossi pop out, these two, yeah, Colossi, he can go ahead and build that fourth base even before the third finishes. He can even start it right now and just cancel it if speed is coming uh, come and attack it. The other thing is he wanted to start the Stargate right now because you know late game PvZ to Mothership is such a powerful tool. Get started that as soon as possible. You don't really need the resources. He could have, yes, he would have had to build one less Colossus, uh, Colossa here. He could have cut out the single Colossus here, and he could have ended up uh, that tuner gas could be built on a Stargate, and then the robotics could be used to build either another Observer or another War Prism, because those you're going to want later on in the game anyway. And you don't need to get four Colossi that fast. You can just get three and then, and then save the gas to get uh, jump on that Mothership tech. So there's a few small optimizations as he's progressing to the late game that make him a little bit stronger. You know, getting the robotics and, and, the, and the gases a little faster early on, and then, of course, getting the fourth base a little faster, getting the mothership tech faster. But overall, you know, he, he's ahead in supply over to Zerg. I mean, it's, a lot of it says Zerg's been banking a lot of money, but uh, the game's not going badly. He's progressing late game perfectly fine. Great play. Now we're going to talk about this stage that a lot of Protoss uh, really want to learn. And this is something that also you'll see all the world-class Protoss doing in the late game. It's talking about how to harass a Zerg player. 
And this is so important because uh, it's, it's pretty much most people believe in a straight on engagement, uh, the Hive Tech Zerg army is usually going to beat the, the late game Protoss army, right? This type of Death Balls type army. But Protoss has War Prisms, which are an insanely powerful way to harass the Zerg player. Broodlords are slow. Infestors uh, are good, but they can't always efficiently clear up a small harass just on their own. So you're going to abuse the mobility Broodlords to work in a lot of harass. Now, the most powerful, uh, sorry, uh, some of the best harasses, uh, they, you need to serve one of three different functions, right? Your harass either has to involve a cost-efficient trade, right? You either have to, whatever you're losing harassing has to be worth less than whatever uh, you're killing from the Zerg player. Either has to be cost-efficient, or it has to move the opposing forces out of position, and then, here's, here's the key part, you move out of position only if you can then utilize the fact you're out of position. So it has to be part of a grander plan. Or the harass has to buy time, but buying time is only valuable if time is worth more for you than it is for them, i.e. you're waiting for a key tech to come into place. Or you're, uh, you have a lot more economy, but they have a bigger army, and you just need to try to give yourself an extra couple minutes to catch up an army size. Something like that is why you need to buy time, waiting for a critical tech, or you have better economy but a weaker army. So harass like this, right? Uh, he's not, he's, he's got this other warp in harass. So he could be, there's two things this drop can do, right? It can do one of two things. Uh, actually one of three things. It could be buying time for, for the mothership. That's very important. Although, uh, you'd rather it drop when the Zerg player starts to move out a tiny bit. But still, just trying to keep it moving around your bases, it means they're not moving out to attack you. So that's good. The other thing it's going to do is it can maybe lure all the speedlings in a Zerg composition. In fact, if you see, there's, there's only one right now, but you, you don't know that. Usually there's a bunch of speedlings. It can lure all the speedlings away to the main, and then all of a sudden this drop can be much more effective. So it can lure the Zerg out of position and be followed up with another attack. And of course, the last thing it can do that's great is it can buy time for that uh, the, the mothership tech here. Uh, and then maybe it'll also be cost efficient. Who knows? Uh, it's unlikely. Most most cell warpints are not going to be cost efficient. Here's the one thing that could be much better is that the main army is back here. It's true you don't want to risk losing the main army, but this is where if you had one or two extra observers, maybe you have an observer right here. Uh, I mean, it might, it might die, but usually if you put it right here, it's actually, it often doesn't get caught, or maybe even right here. And what you do is, you can tell where the army is. When you lure them out of position, not only can this other war prism sneak in from this angle, and all of a sudden you can do damage to their uh, fifth base over here because they're out of position, but you can also punish them from being out of position by sending your main army and working a bit at the spine crawler field, killing a couple creep tumors, pushing back their vision. So your main army should be active uh, as long as you know where their main army is, which is something you should keep it, like you should have an observer right here. Uh, it's keeping kind of a basic eye on them so that you can make your harass a little more effective, get the maximum benefit out of it. So that's a small thing that can be a little bit stronger, try to make the harass a little bit more efficient. So as we go forward here, we're gonna take a look at a couple more harasses that are being done. We're gonna switch back to just his vision. So this one's not bad, you know, he, he got an evolution chamber, uh, killing a couple speedings, and he pulled all the infestors and brewers out of position, and that means all of a sudden this warpin can do a good amount of damage. Now here's the thing, going for the hatcher here is an interesting decision. Uh, y you're going to deny the gas if you kill, which is great, but uh, you're trading cost inefficiently uh, in the long run, because think about this way, the, the, the drones are just going to mine somewhere else. Yeah, it's going to temporarily hurt his gas economy, but if you're playing for the long game, and he, he just realized I went for the, the spines and said, uh, you're not so much worried about destroying their economy, because he's going to mine out all these bases eventually. All right? I mean, that's the general idea. Is that he, this, you've split the map, he's going to mine us out eventually. You're more looking to be cost efficient than just destroy his economy. Uh, so going for the spine crows is a little bit better, as long as you can kill enough like if you warp in enough zealots, you can overwhelm the spine crawlers. So this warp in wasn't that great, except maybe he brought the zergians here, and all of a sudden this warp in can do some extra damage. Uh, we don't know; it probably won't do too much. And the thing here is that when you do this warp in harass, it has to be part of like a greater scheme to dismantle the zerg. So usually that involves uh, either buying time, like right now it's buying time, but later on in the game, if you're not buying time, you want it to be part of a greater scheme to do massive damage. So right here. More bind time. This is actually great warping. Killing these, these uh, spine crows is actually cost efficient. Each spine crow costs 150. So he killed three spine crows there and four zerglings. He probably broke even there. I think he lost like uh, seven zealots. So that's about even. This one again, he's going to kill more spine crows worth of cost than he's going to lose zealots most likely, except actually uh, the Broodlords come in and save it so that, that didn't work, work out as well as he wanted to. So a lot of these attacks are all bind time. 
But now he's at the point where he's got the militia battle now. It's got it's gonna have a vortex by the time the enemy could cross the map. So he doesn't care about buying time anymore because his army's not gonna improve faster than his opponents will. What he cares about now is he cares about um, basically trying to either be cost efficient, and that can be uh, one drop could be cost efficient on its own, or it could lure your opponent out of position and then follow it up with another tech that's cost efficient. And that's very hard to do with just War Prism Harass. It's very, very hard to do, right? I mean, you, you can go around and be annoying, but you're spending a ton of money. In fact, look at the Units Lost tab. Not too cost inefficient, but it's still not going to be cost efficient. So how can you make this stronger? How can you enhance your harass potential as Protoss for Slate Game Zerg? Now, the most powerful harass that Protoss has late game is utilizing your full army at the same time as the War Prism Harass. Because then all of a sudden, if you're ever out of position, your full army can come in and not just kill a couple spine crawlers, but actually kill an entire forest of spine crawlers. Kill some infestors. When infestors try to return, if the brutos aren't quite there, you can get the jump and get a whole bunch of feedback soft. You can do much more damage to the full army. I think everyone knows that. But the problem is it's risky. But as soon as you have this militia here, is that you keep your militia back, and if your ar full army ever gets caught, you can recall out. Now, you don't just want to like run out there, get caught, recall back, and not do anything. So you still want to be careful, but if you're ever out, out of position, and you can trade one recall worth of energy for an entire spine force, that's definitely worth it. You should always take that option uh, if you can get it, because if you keep hitting those spine force, that's going to be very expensive for your Zerg to continually rebuild them, and you're going to win as the game goes on. They start running lower and lower and lower on minerals. So, if we talk about the way to coordinate harass, um, you really want to do a couple things. You want to have your, your main army either here or here, observers in front of your main army to keep track of where infestors and broodards are, and then like exactly what he's doing, one war prism in the main, going for the tech buildings, one war prism over here on, uh, on the bottom right side attacking uh, the, the fifth. So he's doing everything great except you can utilize your main army a little bit more by, by uh, feeling confident that it's okay to get stuck as long as you have the recall. So that's kind of the way the harassment works. As we fast forward through this a little bit, uh, more and more harassment comes down. And this is the point where this has got to be cost efficient. So the storm drops pretty cost efficient. But the zealot warpins are losing cost efficiency because, yes, you kill an infestation pit. And that's nice. But uh, the problem is, is that if you lose eight zealots for an infestation pit, or you're using 800 minerals for 100 minerals, 150 gas, they just rebuild it. Unless you're attacking right then, and the fact that they can't build infestors right then is really key, it's not that big a deal. Uh, so it's starting to get a little bit inefficient with these attacks. If you look at the loss tab, we can tell instead of having a thousand difference in, 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 in the trading, now all of a sudden he's down by 4,000. So the, the harassment is starting to become counterproductive. And this is the point where like my harassment is counterproductive, I have to step it up a notch, or I have to go for an engagement. So you can step it, step it up a notch by utilizing recall, or you could go for that engagement and using void rays is very, very powerful because void rays are really powerful versus units. The only weakness of Void Rays late game is to chain fungals or to infested Terrans. You can mitigate infested Terrans by using High Templar and Psy Storm. You can mitigate chain fungals by using Recall or, of course, Feedback as well. So let's just uh, fast forward to the big engagement he comes into play here. And this is an engagement that you could avoid by just doing constant Void Ray attacks and recalls. But if you want to go for that engagement, we can talk about a little about how to position your army to handle it better. So right here he's coming in, he caught the Zerg out of position with the Harass and, and getting rid of some of the Spines while he can. But then when the Zerg comes in to attack him, all of a sudden here's where things can go just a little bit wrong. A, a good pick off right here, a good pick off right here. But the problem is, is the mothership is with the army. And this type of army here, you don't actually need Vortex. The only thing that can beat this is chain fungals on the Void Rays. And so the only way you can lose is if you're not able to recall your Void Rays out of the battle. And that's exactly what happens here. Unfortunately, all these Void Rays are getting fungled and fungled and fungled, and they can't go after the Broodlings like they'd like to. They're, they're having a hard time actually doing anything but killing Broodlings and Infested Terrans, which isn't that effective. Those are free units as the game goes on. The Chain Fungals take out the Void Rays, and after losing that much cost in Void Rays, all of a sudden, as soon as these blow up, we can check out the Units Lost tab, and it's, it's, it's not good for the Protoss. Now he's 7,000 behind resources lost. The Zerg player, of course, is enough food ahead they can follow through the counter and win the game. So the key thing here is to save that mothership in the back, and you're trading well. The Protoss was trading really well this game up until those Chain Fungals got all the Void Rays. So if you could just avoid those Chain Fungals by using that recall once your Void Rays run out of shields, 
You'd, you'd have killed the Corruptors. You're killing a couple Infestors with, with, with feedback, and all you're losing is a couple Archons and Zealots in the front of your army. And you recall back, you keep repeating this over and over again, and you'll drain the Zerg out of gas as they can't afford to continue to replace the Corruptors very efficiently. So if you want to play late-game PvZ, try to work in recall into your harass, try to work in recall to mix into your army to avoid chain fungals. Thank you guys. Uh, that's it for this segment on the PvZ late-game. We'll take a quick break and be right back with another replay. It's going to be a Terran game. See you guys in a minute.